Well, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Penny Delgadillo, as Josh mentioned. I want to welcome you guys all to our new campus here in Silicon Beach. Um, I run our worldwide ISV marketing, so I work with partners that are trying to monetize their apps, so very attuned to the discussion this morning. Um, and with me today, we've got Louise from Yahoo. Uh, we've got Sam over there from Ingram. We've got Aaron from Sony Pictures, Brandy from the LA Times, and Sarah from Big Frame. Um, so I'm going to have them introduce themselves with their 60-second elevator pitch on what they do. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Louise Rasher. I work for Yahoo uh, in our Burbank office. Um, and I handle trade communications, so B2B marketing um, to our advertising community. So that's through our blog, website, social channels, uh, etc. Walking. I'm Brandy Lascalzo, and I work for the LA Times, and I'm a digital and mobile sales manager for the Orange County region, so I build strategies for businesses, specifically with digital and social. Hi, my name is Sam Roth. I work as a marketing manager at Ingram Micro. I specialize in campaigns and programs, and I work in the uh, healthcare and public sector industries. Hi, I'm Sarah Penna, the co-founder and chief creative officer at Big Frame, which is probably the one company you guys don't recognize on this <laughs> panel. Um, Big Frame is a media company and management company. We manage about 300 YouTube influencers. I think there's some more YouTube stuff happening later in the day. Um, we were recently acquired by DreamWorks and merged with their digital division, Awesomeness TV, where we'll be expanding in internationally and doing a lot of teen and tween Focus programming. I'm Aaron Wall. I uh, work in international marketing for the motion picture group at Sony Pictures. Uh, so basically, everywhere but North America, we put together you know, worldwide campaigns for all the movies you see out of Sony Studios. Okay. Uh, so before we get started for our panelists, I want to understand from the room, how many of you are thinking in the next 3 to 12 months to actually expand your B2B partnerships and potentially do some uh, SEO on B2B? Okay. And then, okay, there's a few of you. How many of you are currently already having B2B partnerships online and also investing? Okay, so that gives you guys a flavor for the room. Um, so we know that from most companies, they face the build by partner syndrome, and that 50% of ventures fail if they don't have the right partnerships and social strategies attached to that. And we also know that today, there is a formula for monetizing social advertising. So with that, I want to start with maybe the gentleman at the end, Andy, around you know what are some things that are working in your industry, especially for you as you're sort of advertising movies and making sure that they get monetized. I mean, for us, it's, it's uh, really about content. And uh, so we partnered recently with Evian Worldwide, um, had our director and creative put into an Evian spot that um, went very Fairly viral, uh, mostly in Europe. Um, I, again, I think for us, you know, we're a creative company. It's all about the entertainment value of it, and really, from there, from my side, really pushing people to buy ticketing. So that's where the B two B comes in. We do a lot of co marketing uh, with the circuits, the theater chains, um, and so working with IMAX, uh, which is a great partner globally, uh, or Cinemark and Latam. Again, making sure that you know, obviously, our release date is there, and then pushing to the ticketing platforms from there. So for us, it's working about great, you know, with great partners. We just actually found out. We were working together with uh, Big Frame on uh, 22 Jump Street. Um, but again, really getting some good influencers and partners like that that are marketing and pushing those two brands together. And we do those kinds of planning you know, three three years in advance sometimes on the Bonds and Spider-Mans of the world. A little bit tighter, uh, tight frame, you know, for the 22 Jump Streets of the world. Sarah, do you want to take a next? Yeah. Um, so we are very focused on connecting our talent, our influencers with advertisers. And you know, this I think this is a great example of um, a really great integrated campaign where one of our uh, YouTube influencers was actually cast on 22 Jump Street, and now we're using his social channels, his YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, which are very robust and buying out um, to you know to help market the, the movie. Um, and I think uh, you know that's just a that's one example of many. We work with a lot of large brands and apps and sort of e-commerce sites that are just getting off the ground to help them market to a very dedicated um, 
audience who's very, very engaged and willing to, you know, we kind of live and die by CTR or click through rate. Um, so we work with places like audible.com where they're looking for people to sign up for an account and they will you know, tap into our network of influencers who will provide a link in a description of a video and we will track how many clicks that gets. So you heard the gentleman this morning talking about millions of people watch, you know, a TV ad, but there's not really, first of all, you can't really track that and also, you know, the, the conversion rate just isn't there. Whereas for us, it's so immediate, it's so direct, you can really kind of see who's clicking on this, where they're living, where the, what their demographic is, and if they're, you know, if they're click, just clicking or they're actually purchasing or signing up for a service. A lot more kind of individualized, um, tailored, proprietary technologies coming out, but I would say Sugar is a big one that we use, and then also um, Fan Finder, or Fan Bridge, sorry. Fan Bridge, which is a, um, it sort of helps you send out newsletters and track those and, and do analytics around who's opening your newsletters and those kinds of things. I think we've used just about every <laughs> system <Yeah>. name to <laughs> here. Um, we have more specialized ones for specific movie tracking you know, around the world. Um, but what I would say is that it's more people-oriented. I think in ours, it's more about who are the trusted partners to tell that story. And you know, one thing that we always look at being in sort of story business is how can we craft a story that really tells how we're getting to people and then that ultimately influences how we're seeing tracking. So we track all demographic groups and then on the exit reports of movies, we're really looking at where people are noticing our movies. And I would say YouTube is by far the, the, the biggest place besides television. Um, although their budgets are probably about 100 times what they give to digital, um, but still very close within percentages. So I think for us, it's really about finding the right partners and seeing how they're going to measure the ROI. I mean, just on a monopoly basis, we're not allowed to really sell tickets, um, you know, which is that's good progressive. I find it funny that I'm now for monopolies, but we're not allowed to do that anymore. Um, but basically, you know, again, I think it's really about finding that story and, and that, a suite that you're comfortable with and trying to market movie over movie to see how you can improve that ROI. And we're definitely not allowed to data driven decisions. Um, it's harder because it's so fractured right now. There's no one sort of Nielsen, if you will, or flaw that may be. Um, so I think for us, it's really about finding a trusted partner and seeing what their suite of tools is and seeing if they're coming up with a consistent story time over time. And I think one of the things um, on the tool side that I've noticed with the apps that I take to market is that you have to think big, <clears throat> meaning that you know when you're thinking about tool sets like Marketo and Sprinkler, those tools can sort of grow with you. Um, so you can start in early um, and have lower price points and then they sort of grow with you. So always think big around your infrastructure because obviously you're just gonna have to maintain more. And I think a lot of people start with, hey, I'm a small you know, startup or I have a small app, um, you know, and they don't really think big from an infrastructure standpoint when, when the reporting is going to be key to your business. So that's one of the things that I've noticed. Um, great, so I want to move on to some case studies. I think I, all of you have real world examples of what's worked. So um, can you share with the audience potentially one case or win that you thought went really, really well and why? Um, sure. I, I think uh, for me, the most successful one that we've seen certainly has been the one with uh, Evian, who's been a great uh, partner to Spider-Man in general. Um, you know, coming up with content that really allows them to leverage all their social channels. But I think it, you know, really is a partnership. Um, once they agree to put on all their social channels, we do the same, retweet, follow, all that good stuff. Um, and I think the other one with Bond was definitely Heineken, who's great global operator who has a great social presence and it really understands how um, you know people operate in the social space. I mean one of the things that we've noticed is that you know you speak to people, yes you're authentic, but you speak to people differently on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, these are all sort of really different audiences. You have the same message where you have to sort of recraft it for every one of those. Um, and Heineken was a really great partner for that. And uh, again on a global basis when you're talking about translating it and really even the creative changes from time to time the images that we use change from continent to continent, country to country. Um, that was a really successful one for us. Obviously, the film did very well. Um, but again, I think it really you have to go into partnership um, with that and plan way, way early. I think that's that's the biggest uh, note that we've had is that sometimes we rush into things 
Um, some people are a little more turnkey. I mean, Big Frank has been a great partner. Get on 22 Jump Street. Um, easy to get going. Talent is involved. It makes it easier. But for us, you know, when we're talking about even the next bond, you know, which is coming on 16, um, you know, we're starting now already. Um, and talking about those partnerships and how we're getting a content calendar out there, how we're going to monetize, how we're going to make sure that we're doing well for both parties. So they want to have people drink more Heineken. We want people to go see the movie. Um, you know, what are their ROI? What is ours? And we really come up with that plan and structure with very, very long leads so that once we get into the meat of it, um, you know, we all know what we're trying to do and then, you know, conference call after conference call after conference call, make sure that that all goes through. So it sounds like really pick a partner that sort of gels with your values and core mission of your business. Yeah, definitely. The culture is huge, and I think the core values of you know making sure that the brands are definitely aligned yeah. um, and that the marketers themselves are aligned because we've seen, you know, People who you think would be a natural alignment, but right. the marketers themselves didn't quite gel. It was a chemistry test, you know, from the get go, just like picking an agency. And so you really have to sort of be on the same wavelength um, as far as what your goals are and how you're going to achieve that. Right. How about you, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think that's very true. I mean, that I, when the first thing that we ask an advertiser when they approach us is, what are your goals of your campaign? So I would say, um, you know, one that was really successful for us was we did a huge activation for Pepsi around the Super Bowl. I mean, Super Bowl is such a traditional media buying, you know, you know exactly, it's all about the ads. So I thought it was really neat that they sort of stepped a little bit outside of the boundaries of what they used, used to doing. Um, we did this big activation with four of our influencers. They actually flew them to the Super Bowl. They had them in the Pepsi suite. Um, they had you know, them tweeting and Facebooking, but they also made specific videos that were then um, calls to action for their audience to send in pictures that were then used in a TV commercial. So it was so many layers of activation, which um, if any of you have worked with brands, can be an absolute nightmare, or it can work really well. And in this case, it worked really well. And it was um, exciting for our talent because they got to be in a TV commercial, got to go to the Super Bowl, and got paid for it, um, and exciting for the brand because if they activated their audience, they got a ton of submissions. And I think as a brand, when you're asking for user submissions, I think it's this sort of like, oh, we're going to crowdfund it, and you're in the room, and it sounds really sexy, and then like five people submit, and it's really embarrassing. I mean, that's like, I think everyone who's like tried that has experienced it, and you're like, ooh, um, <laughs> this is awkward. So, and then you have to like have everyone in the office submit. It's very awkward. Um, so in this case, you know, they had they were just flooded with tons of submissions, and they were really it was really successful. But very. Sam, any best practices, case studies? Um, in from just from our industry, yeah. the distribution. Uh, one thing that's worked really well for us has been just blogging in terms of thought leadership approaches, okay. um, and how we use that to sort of acquire leads is is we'll sort of pitch our blogs and, and sort of spin it in the way of a natural sales cycle, uh, but in a way that it feels more organic. So we'll start talking about the need for a given type of technology, whether that be in the healthcare space or the educational and state and local space, and then we'll express how a given solution can address that need. Um, and, we're, and we have to be really vendor agnostic from our approach, considering we work with different competitors. Um, so I mean, we distribute everything from Apple to Google to Samsung to HP, Lenovo. So we have to be very vendor agnostic in that sense. And what we do is we ultimately vet those leads from our reseller base. And once it gets to a point where we think they're ready for that purchase, uh, ready to initiate that buying cycle, uh, we pass them off to actually our account executives who further vet that lead. Um, I guess I guess the best way to put it would be through a consultative approach. Yep. Um, because I think that's how the sales cycle is really evolving, not within just my given industry, but across all of them. All industries, um, and so that's how we do it. We do it on a needs basis, right? This is the need expressed. How do we address that need with a given technology segment within a given technology segment, and with what technology segments? Whether that be in terms of SaaS solutions or you know, just tangible products. And I think Sam brought up a good point around CTAs, calls to action. I think that's one of the sort of tips this time around with social is that you can really get targeted and have a strong call to action to make that social action a converted lead. 
Um, I, I'm always looking for social media case studies. And so I'll point you to, and it may sound funny, but WWE. And I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but I, you know, in my search for like who's doing social well, um, not only from a B2B perspective, but from a B2C perspective. And I would really point you to like take a look at what they're doing socially. Um, one of the things that I see is that they've integrated social throughout their business plan. And I think that's the number one thing. Like how is social going to play a role in my business? You need to ask yourself that. You know, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does. That's something that you'll have to like really delve into and, and really pull out. And then, then once you've done that, then you know, where are my where are my leads and what are they doing and how do I address them? One of the things that I think um, WWE does very well is that everyone plays in social. All of their members play. All of their um, you know folks are tweeting, their wrestlers are tweeting, their you know managers are tweeting, everybody's out there and they're in that social sphere. Um, so and one of the other things that I really like that they do, they harness the power of video. So video is one of those things that can stop a user in the stream, right? Midstream. Everybody's streaming. You know, all of our devices were scrolling, 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 and video will capture attention. So if you have the opportunity to make a video where you're talking about what your company can do for those people that you want to buy from you, definitely do that. WWE does that well. The other thing is that they carry the story offline or online. So they'll, you know, they have an action scene together and they're fighting and they're whatever, and then you can go on social and you can find out what happened after and, and how it works. And you can do the same thing with your business, right? So whatever story, whatever emails you're sending out, whatever white papers you're producing, whatever you know things you have going on that you're pushing from a marketing perspective, what are you doing socially to continue that story? That's great. Um, so maybe one thing that's a little bit of a different pivot here for us too is how social can help amplify B2B events. Um, so we had a really large uh, trade event this week called the Digital Content New Fronts where all of the digital programmers were out in New York uh, presenting to the advertising community all the new programs and opportunities, ad opportunities that are available. So we had a really large um, B2B digital and out of home campaign running in New York and throughout JFK Airport. So we took assets from that campaign, put it uh, on our social presences. So. Um, um, that everything would have a, a similar look and feel. There's a hashtag for the campaign uh, that we were using in our tweets. Um, we developed some some content pieces around that campaign, so everything sort of you know fit together and, and amplified it. And then another layer to add on top of that is you know you can do all those things organically, but if you have the budget to also do a little bit of a, a paid sponsorship layer within social. So one thing that's worked really well for us is to do um, uh, promoted posts on LinkedIn. So you have your corporate page, your main page, and you can post organically there, and then you can sponsor um, whichever organic posts you select. And LinkedIn has some pretty good targeting parameters. So for us, in particular, it's really helpful because it's it's very hard to find the audience that we want, like very specifically, prescriptively. Um, and LinkedIn is terrific for that. So you can target by job title, um, job function, industry. So we really are able to uh, help ensure that our content is getting distributed to the folks that we want to have see it. Okay. Um, so at this point, I know you probably all have a ton of questions. Uh, so I wanted to open the floor up for questions um, for any of the topics that we covered here. Um, how much time do you allow or plan to tell your story online, and how often do you post once the timeline is developed? So let me repeat it by the camera. Um, and so the question is, how much time do you allot to sort of post your story and then let it run mm -hmm. on social? I'll take a step. Okay. Um, we have multiple programs running simultaneously, so it really kind of depends. It can depend on the duration of the program itself. We have, for example, um, a promotion going right now. It's, it's a competition called the Yahoo Media Stars. There's a three phases to that program. So we have we developed a content plan for each phase, and they each have kind of a, a start and stop time. Others are kind of more one-offs, but you know we'll try to look at as much as we can. So you put up a blog post, you put up social posts, etc. Sometimes you release a study, and that study might have a lot of really great insights and so you'll chunk that up into three pieces. Maybe it's one blog post, an infographic, an interview, and then you kind of you know milk that through social. So I think it really kind of depends um, 
how much we there is to work with within the story. Um, I think it also depends on the audience, right? So the size of your audience socially might depend on how much that audience can withstand or bear. So, and also you have to keep in mind the algorithmic uh, pieces of each social, cha social channel. So we all know that Facebook does not show all of your posts to all of your fans or followers. So you take that into consideration. What's the right time to post? Go into Facebook, look at what, you know, when you have your highest you know, availability, post then. Um, I think you have to kind of test it, right? So you have to like, you know, start small, gain big, or start big and pare down. So. Um, in terms of our, say, Twitter or in terms of our Facebook following, that's something that we try to constantly and consistently do, uh, whether that be promotion at our events, through contests. Um, I remember one thing we did at a more specialized healthcare event that we put together was uh, we put together a contest based on Facebook likes. So we literally set up a station with a couple laptops and said, hey, if you do like our page and through Facebook Insights, you can actually check who liked uh, your page within a given time frame. What we do is we pull those all together and run a contest and a raffle or a drawing or something of that nature just to recruit more people to like our page. Um, in terms of, um, again, social media engagement, um, we find it most useful in terms of a reinforcement tool. Um, so say following events or pre-event, we'll use that as a sort of recruiting tool and, and, and an update, and as an update tool in terms of this is what's going on, this is who we have speaking. Um, a lot actually like today's event where you had those tweets go out about the different speakers, the different panelists present. I mean, speaking to algorithm, YouTube is very, very algorithmic heavy. Um, so before, I think it was like a year and a half ago, they changed the algorithm. Before that, it was very important like what time and what day that you uploaded. And so all the big YouTube talent like knew exactly when to upload, like the minute, and they knew everyone else's schedule so that you could get to the homepage. There's not a homepage anymore. And views, number of views within a 24 hour period is no longer the, the metric that's what we did the heaviest. It's actually something called watch time so um, and they did this because people were gaming the system and they were figuring out like okay if I put like a sexy girl in my thumbnail and it's called like Justin Bieber gets arrested and I'm gonna get like all these clicks even if it was just me talking um, and people might click on it and click off that still counts as a clip so what YouTube did was say okay no you actually need to people you actually need to grab people's attention they actually need to watch your video so they shifted the algorithm to, to favor um, watch time and we saw a lot of significant changes we had some channels that like had one or two videos that were like that, like sexy girl in the thumbnail thing, and they just like they're. It's funny to look at the graphics; like their traffic's this, and then just that day literally goes down. So, can I um, ask you a question? Yeah. Do they make a, a official or formal announcement about that, or did mm -hmm. it just change one day and people have to figure it out? <laughs> um, well, they told us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, they told partner, but what about the rest? No, they just change it. Right. They just change it, and they release a blog post. So it's um, really exciting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're constantly making these little. That was probably the biggest change to the to YouTube that they've made ever since the beginning. Was um, I mean, there've been a lot of big changes. They just changed the comment system, which is actually amazing um, if you've noticed, and uh, you know, sort of helps keep the trolls at bay um, a little bit. Um, <laughs> and you can actually like, block comments now and stuff. So, but now, um, you know, a, a lot of our YouTube talent will ask, okay, what's the best day and time? And it's like, well, it doesn't really matter anymore. What matters is consistency. And so it's about, you know, if you're, there's so much content out there and there's so many things you have to say, I'm gonna upload every Monday or I'm gonna upload every Tuesday and Thursday, <laughs> whatever it is, it doesn't really, frankly, really doesn't matter but it matters about communicating that consistently. I mean, if you watch a bunch of YouTube videos, you're gonna get annoyed, like, I upload videos every Monday, yes, I know. But, you know, not everyone knows. So you're kind of training your audience to tune in at a certain point of time. Uh, we also notice sometimes people who are posting, like, a Saturday video and then a Sunday video, that the Sunday video would kind of cannibalize the views of the Saturday video. So it's really about, like, you know, spreading out the content unless you're uploading every day, and then, you know, being very consistent and being very, you know, consistent in telling people about it. I would agree with the consistency side, I and mean, we definitely start a couple times a week. Once we get into release week, we're three times a day. Um, but making sure that they know every Monday you're going to get, you know, 
know, female oriented story or Thursday is really action packed kind of stories and making sure that they do that. I and mean, we're also lucky that we manage the social media for all the other titles that would relate to a movie. So all the other Spider-Man and all the other Green Hornet and everything else. And we can push from there to our other social media channels. And then as we release it, I mean, if it's not performing what we want, we run media at it. You know, that we just have to do it. There's Facebook in particular, as they change their algorithm and it goes down, down, down. Um, you really need to run media at it for sure. And then the other things that, you know, we have all of our channels working together, so there's not a trailer that goes out that doesn't have a social media call to action, a hashtag burn in, a specific audible call out at the end, go to Facebook and like us, share, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's really important for the rest, you know, the other parts of any company to really be working together in social media so that they all understand that's where things are tracked and that's where people should be going. And we, you know, raise that loud and clear in every meeting we're in. Um, it's sometimes win that battle, sometimes you don't. But again, I really feel like everything should have a call to action. You should always tell your customers exactly what you want them to do um, and then make it easy for them to do that. Um, and again, just kind of keeps like, it gets annoying, I think, because I see all the posts from everything we do, so it's kind of a clutter. But as we know, that everybody does not always check it as habitually as I do, first of all. But also, they just algorithmically they don't get all that content. So I think the more is, is better. But also just making really engaging content that people want to see and not always so on the nose with things. And we run all kinds of different media and creative at people to make sure that we're not just marketing the release date, the release date, release date, making sure that it's actually interesting content for people. Um, which is why we use influencers, which is why we use graphic artists, which is why we pull from all corners of the creative world to make sure that you know the creative is stunning and we'll get people interested in our campaign and hopefully like it and see the rest of what we've done. So it sounds like there's no straight answer yeah. for your question. <laughs> However, we heard consistency, content is king, moments in time campaigns actually work and really know your audience to see how much you can actually use them for the campaign. Um, other questions? Yes. So when you folks talk about Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that, how much importance does your company place on posting on LinkedIn? So I'm going to just repeat the question from the camera. Uh, so we've heard a lot about posting Facebook, Twitter. How much importance do these folks um, put on posting on LinkedIn? I mean, for the BSC side, not very much, but I think as far as getting the best people in the door so that they can do that great work, huge. I mean, I don't know of any other place or any better place to find the professionals that you need. Um, I think it's also with Pulse and those kinds of things really becoming the best place for business sort of stories and things like that. Definitely getting a little spammy, but otherwise it, it really is, I think, the best place to find those kind of professionals and also the recommendations. I mean, when we see, you know, we open up um, any, any level, you see, you know, 500 resumes come in, but when we start to check and Google people and we definitely um, look at people's social media, you know, you can see the circles that they're in and that who they've worked with, and I think it's a very entertaining, it's a pretty small community, but um, you can definitely see who they know and who they've worked with, and I think that's a really powerful tool for us. Um, and then, you know, the other piece is just, again, looking at Pulse, I definitely get a lot of personal information out of it, so I think LinkedIn is a super powerful for us on the B2B side of just getting the right people in the door to do the great work. So let's move it to Louise, because I know she had some really great examples around um, targeting advertisers. Yeah, so for, um, if I were speaking to the consumer side of the house at Yahoo, I'd give a different answer, but definitely on the B2B side, LinkedIn's probably our most important channel. It is the only place where you can target so precisely the, the type of industry you're, you're looking to go after. For example, um, the white paper I mentioned earlier that we just released, it has uh, very much a mobile slant to it. So in addition to the regular core campaign, sponsored campaign that we have going on LinkedIn, we add in additional targeting parameters that were very mobile oriented. So if you're doing content marketing um, on LinkedIn and you're sponsoring off of a core page or posting off of a core page and you want to boost that post, you can uh, specify all kinds of targeting parameters. So it's it's extremely helpful that way. And it's brought a lot of additional traffic back to our site. I mean, again, in the B2B space, it's very niche. So we're not talking huge numbers, but relative to us, they are really big numbers. The um, two posts that we put up this year that have um, performed the best out of any post we've ever done socially got over a thousand shares on LinkedIn, which for us is a lot. It's really a lot. I mean, that's, those are really small numbers um, in terms of social sharing for consumer content, but for B2B content, that's really a lot. 
Um, so yeah, for us, it's, it's hugely important. I would say, and I'm going to pass it to Brandon and, and Sam, because I know you guys probably have um, stuff to chime in on. From a LinkedIn perspective, what I see with my commercial apps that are looking for enterprise sales, LinkedIn has been a tremendous asset for us. So we can do a financial services campaign for a line of business app and target you know, top 100 CIOs. Um, we could do some partner-to-partner -partner event marketing on LinkedIn to bring our system integrators with our ISV developers and really get a targeted approach. I would say it's probably the most expensive media, so where maybe you're buying you know, a, a two, two cents on an email on LinkedIn, it's $2. Um, so I would say be very targeted in that. And I'm going to pass it to you, Brandon, because you probably have some expertise on that. Um, and, and actually LinkedIn is where Josh and I kind of connected. So for the whole, you know. <laughs> so beware, he recruits yeah. on LinkedIn. <laughs> well, and, and, and so I think from a, you know, from a, from my perspective, I certainly have a feed that um, I set up automated that I'm feeding out marketing information to try and attract businesses or try and attract partners. So uh, definitely use the tools that are out there, ifttt.com, twitterfeed.com, you could actually feed into LinkedIn as well, on, you know, several other their channel so you know feed in content and, and create yourself you know or position yourself tell your story that you're the expert in your field you're the expert in your business create a create a LinkedIn group you know start networking within groups as well that's a great way to meet uh, business partners joining you know various groups and then actually going on to the pages wishing people congratulations on their promotion you know telling people happy birthday even through LinkedIn I, I spend um, I, I would say I spend 15 minutes every week going to LinkedIn and you know, telling people congratulations, commenting in groups, doing things like that, um, as well as just you know trying to reach out and connect with people who are you know sending them in mail. Can I ask you another LinkedIn question? If you don't mind. Yeah. So LinkedIn just launched this long form content service where they they, they rolled it out to twenty five thousand people, and I actually got an invite. And what it is is I guess it's allowing me to go in and out use LinkedIn as a blog platform. I know. Has anybody tried that yet? I mean, I haven't tried it. I haven't tried, tried it. it. I, got, I got an invite. I haven't tried it yet. So when you, let, when you do, will you yeah, let me know? Connect, right? I'm going to follow you, and that way, when, I, when you post it, I'll see what it does. Yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of LinkedIn, we haven't developed that platform as much as we'd like to, and I think one of the reasons why is because uh, my company is actually really siloed um, because of the different technology sectors that we play into. And uh, I mean, it, it is very specialized in the sense that you can target a specific type of industry or a given healthcare or a given vertical. But uh, we actually are looking for that tertiary level of segmentation in terms of, all right, great, is this a big data vendor? Is this a cloud services vendor? Is this a uh, networking storage vendor or whatnot? So um, in terms of that, how we, I think, most effectively use LinkedIn is, is building our program managers or our subject matter experts as, as influencers and people to really follow. Um, and then from there, once we have built that influencer base, um, is when we decide to sort of, I guess, push forward with that platform in terms of an official page where all those different employers can follow the gate and spur conversation. What other questions do we have? Oh, there we go. Do you guys have any advice or best practices for working with partners who are from the less savvy with a lot of this stuff? We are a lot of folks who are, you know. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the question is, um, tips and tricks, best practices on working with partners that are a little bit less established from social media practices. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to bring it. Oh, come on. Fight for it. Fight for it. Um, we take kind of like an educational perspective. So, I mean, it's unfortunate because it adds another layer of time and energy and all of that. But we sort of have a mentality of like, okay, if we can educate this advertiser, maybe they will then spread the word. And, um, you know, it has worked over the last couple of years. So, our sales team in particular, you know, the first like four pages of our sales staff are like, 
basics about what YouTube is, what an influencer is, what does that mean, what are the options for you as a brand to integrate with an influencer, what uh, we don't do, which is guarantee viral videos, and nor do we use the term viral videos typically. Um, if that happens, fantastic, but we're much more focused on sort of like ROI and, and getting the advertiser to really define their goal. I think the, you know, I've said this before, but the biggest mistake is when we are working with an advertiser, they're like, I just want a cool video. And at the end, they're like, okay, that was a cool video, but then what? You know, and so we kind of educate them on what the then what is. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of them have unrealistic expectations um, in the term, in sense, like their campaign will start as, we want this influencer to tweet 20 times in an hour about our product. I'm like, okay, well, that might sound like a good idea, but in fact, you will you will anger their audience and you don't want to do that. And so, you know, not, it's not, there's no perfect kind of formula, but we really just kind of take this like patient, educational, um, you know, if, if this advertiser works with us and it's a success, then they'll spend more money and that's worked out really well for us. But yeah, I mean, it's, it can be, internally, we have a lot of jokes about it. <laughs> Externally, we are very patient. <laughs> You're on video. <laughs> Um, a couple of resources, HubSpot.com. Um, they have some great white papers. They're very um, beginner oriented. I, I download them myself, and I save them, and then I shoot those out. So also eMarketer.com. Um, I've subscribed clients like that to their email class. I've told them, but I've subscribed them myself. So that they'll get something in their email that, that is educational, graphic, and then kind of get you know some sense that this is important and, and it's valuable to your business. Um, and I think just to add on to what she said about education, uh, it's really important that she also is getting to, uh, in terms of setting expectations. Um, so what you want to do is first you want to set that tone. It's always a difficult conversation to have because you're talking about accountability and, and, and the, the principles of responsibility ultimately at play. So you, you have to have that conversation in order to have a healthy business relationship. Um, so you understand which side of the picture is delivering on what. Um, so ultimately at the, at the end of the day, both of you guys can deliver on that promise. Um, so setting expectations is really good. Also, having that just initial conversation to garner that knowledge to see whether or not the client you're working with or the vendor you're working with is knowledgeable about social media and the platforms, but more importantly, how they work. Um, you have to make sure you have that conversation so you, so you can understand from your perspective whether you have to play that consultative role or you, know, you can sit back and let that other person take the lead in terms of how they want to drive their campaign or their Engagement. Great. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, when you do identify a partner with your personal marketing, um, what are some of the methods that are most effective for when you're trying to reach out and actually like, set a conversation? Happy Actually, that, that, is, that is uh, actually a really good way for us in terms of uh, just because channel distribution is so heavily reliant on the person to person relationship. Um, and, and I think a lot of B2B is actually relying on person to person engagement. And I think that's why experience plays such a big role in, in B2B environments. It's because the people with the experience have had the time um, to build those relationships and to foster those relationships for successful business. Louis, do you have something to chime in on? Yeah, I mean, I would echo what Sam said. It, uh, our industry is very small, um, so there are a lot of relationships already. Or, you know, even if you don't have that personal relationship, um, you might want to partner with, say, an industry organization. So we've done a partnership recently with the IAB, um, and we have a relationship with the president and CEO. And so he was able to come in to one of the, our core programs that we're doing right now, and. Um, uh, serve as a role there, do some promotional content for us. So if, if you are truly doing it in a B2B capacity, um, either perhaps someone within your company um, may have a personal relationship or you may have a personal relationship with a trade organization, but if not, and it's truly just a, you know, 
hey, here's this partner we'd like to work with, how do we best approach them? It also kind of depends on who that partner is. You could just try reaching out to them directly through their social channels and see if they respond, if they have representation. You know, sometimes if it's like a person who's big on the speaking circuit, they have people that manage them. Um, so it really kind of depends. I think it's, it is easiest if it is truly in a B2B capacity and it is that sort of small world and then you can find, you know, can you reach out to them through LinkedIn? Um, but if it's someone who's more of a personality, then that's, that's where it becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, I always say challenge them. Challenge the customer because they hear all the time, this is a great product and my service is great, but, but challenge them. What you know, fear motivates people more than the you know, fear of loss motivates people more than the happiness of gain. So use that in your tactics as far as you know, if you see something that you know your company can provide a solution with if you partner, um, tweak that, you know, in, in their world and, and share with them, you know, here's your problem and here's the solution, it's us. I always say there's six degrees of separation, so whenever you're trying to stop a partnership, you're always going to find someone who knows someone who knows someone. So always find that like angle in, and you'll always find it. Other questions? Great. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists for their wonderful wisdom. Um, so thank you.